Hey everyone, welcome to the Tell Me More podcast where we talk about our sermon from the past weekend. We are in a series called Major Lessons from Minor Prophets, and this is actually being recorded a couple weeks later, but you talked about Zechariah. I did. Um, And so we are going to walk through a little bit of that today. You promised the people a podcast. I did, and and I didn't realize that, well, my calendar was wrong. Yeah. And so... I thought I was going to be recording a podcast that following Monday, and I we didn't. And so we're doing it later because we said we would. Yeah. So here it is. So here it is. And, you know, I don't know how much of this you kept kept <laughs> fresh in your mind. We're going to find out enough here for, in Enough just to a record second. a podcast, yeah. Okay. Okay. This is going to be great. I first have to find the book of Zechariah. It's one of the longer... It is. ...longer prophets. Um, 14 chapters. Okay. Yeah. You talked about the Holy Spirit a lot in yeah. Zechariah. Yeah. So let's, I don't know, if you, do you want to talk about chapter three at all or do we want to jump right yeah, I mean, into let's, chapter four? Let, let, yeah, let's do it because, so there's both, I think what you could say about Zechariah is there's both an immediate application to this for them, but yeah. also an eschatological implication as well. In other words, we're seeing also pictures of, kind of things to come and things of the, I think, of the end as well that are ultimately going to be completely fulfilled in in Jesus. Um, and so the, the kind of culmination, I think it's similar to Revelation, as we talked about, Revelation being both a letter and a prophecy or a, a foretelling mm, of the future, mm. but also uh, a word in the now. And that's, that's a tension that you find in some of these prophetic... So if you've ever read... Uh, the New Testament and found prophecies about Jesus. And if you've ever bothered to go back, you know, it'll say this, Matthew particularly, this fulfills, you know, what was written by the prophet Isaiah or or whomever. Um, And it's a fulfillment of Jesus, uh, that Jesus, something that Jesus fulfills. But then you go back and read it in its context, and it isn't, it isn't readily apparent that it's messianic in the Old Testament. So what it means, does this make sense to like, uh, out of Egypt have I called oh, my son yes. as one of these? Yeah. Where you go, if, and, I, and I'm not going to remember where that is. I want to yeah. say it's in Isaiah. But that that when you read it in its context, mm-hmm. it doesn't, it, it, it's not like an obvious, like Isaiah 53, which feels right. like an obvious allusion to mm-hmm. Christ. But there are other allusions to Christ that seem a bit more veiled Seemingly, like uh, we saw this in Haggai. So, for example, in Haggai, there are promises made to Zerubbabel that don't come to pass in Zerubbabel's lifetime, right. what he's going to do. And I think similarly here, you're going to find some things. Some that's because Zerubbabel, it, it's he's he's speaking to the Messiah who mm-hmm. would come from. Mm-hmm. Zerubbabel. So there's mm-hmm. this this duality of mm-hmm. of of what's in part going to be fulfilled now, but yeah. what will ultimately be realized in the end and you, through Christ yeah. specifically. And you really do see this in the New Testament over and over and over again. You see it in uh, Luke, is it 23 or 24, where Jesus uh, the two, on the road Emmaus? to Emmaus, 24. and he opens up the scriptures to them, yeah. and then they're like, Oh, oh, that was all about you? Oh, yeah. yeah. And yeah. then he yeah. talks about it in John chapter 8. But then you see it all throughout Acts. You see Peter kind of explaining. He talks about, he he quotes Joel, but then he also talks about King David. And he yeah. says, David is dead and buried. Yeah. So he is not the Messiah. So exactly. Yeah. So yeah. it's so you, so you are meant to look at David and right. go, is this... Is this who God is? Is this our? Is this the king where we're looking for? Yeah. Is this the one that Moses prophesied about and said there'll be yeah. another like me? Is that him? Yeah. But then ultimately you would realize, no. And again, if you're reading through the old, the whole of the Old Testament, that would be the way you would feel. Is like even going all the way back to Genesis three fifteen, the proto gospel, where it's mm-hmm. the first proto, gospel. You and Gileon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it's this. Yeah. So it's this this promise that someone's going to come that's yeah. going to crush the serpent's head. And so you would be looking for him to come, yeah. and you might wonder, is it going to be no? No, is it going to be Moses? It doesn't end up being Moses. And you see some yeah. characteristics, right. messa- messianic characteristics in these people. It's almost like, yeah. okay, they have this, but they aren't. Particularly, they don't have David that. is one yeah. that gets really centered on. I mm-hmm. would think even more so than someone like Moses mm-hmm. has messianic sort of. Uh, I don't want to call it illusions, but his life has mm-hmm. ha, has this kind of 
yeah, he, he, this king, this great mm-hmm. king, mm-hmm. but ultimately it's an incomplete reign and it doesn't end up working out all the way. And then Israel just kind of falls apart shortly after yeah. his death, uh, well, really Solomon's. And so anyway, yeah. So I think it's important to just see that we're reading, we're reading both about uh, Joshua, who actually that's Yeshua in, in Hebrew, mm-hmm. the name of Jesus as a priest here, but then also Zerubbabel. Um, so yeah, we can we can jump right in. So maybe let's just begin in, in chapter three. Okay. So I'm gonna just read it. I think it'll be helpful. We didn't read this in any of the um, in any of the services, but I think it's really good. Uh, then the Lord showed me Joshua, and I'm not going to unpack all of this. There's some interesting elements in here, it particularly is. with Satan. Yeah, uh, Joshua, but it is well, we, so it'll be fun to unpack. Uh, Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan. That's a title um, that just means uh, accuser. accuser. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, without getting too deep into it, Satan, Old Testament Satan, is a. Um, Almost like a prosecuting attorney in a court. Mm. Uh, you see him in 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 mm-hmm. uh, Job as well, kind of functioning this sort of adversarial role. Some people posit that this was his role was to play this sort of prosec- prosec- mm. prosecutorial role mm-hmm. in the divine council. The divine council, mm-hmm. yeah. For you, if we want to go all Michael Heiser mm-hmm. on people, yeah. And then, and he kind of takes it too far, mm. and he ends up becoming a total adversary. But here he is standing at the right, uh, at his right side, to accuse him. Who is him? Joshua, the high priest. Mm. So this priestly character is brought forward, and this accuser is saying, "I've got some accusations against him. He's not worthy." Mm. Essentially, so the Lord said to Satan, "The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you." Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Not going to get into all this. Don't have time. Uh, now, Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes. So what is this? Does this remind you of another uh, uh, prophecy at all? Do, can you think of uh, the filthy clothes standing before the Lord? So woe is me. Oh, is he? Uh, is I am he, undone. I am yeah. a man of unclean Isaiah lips. Isaiah 6? Yeah. That's what I think yeah. of. Okay. As he stood before the angel, so there's this recognition of mm-hmm. guilt and mm-hmm. sin. Mm-hmm. And the angel said to those who were standing uh, before him, so similar thing, interesting, take off his filthy clothes, very yeah. similar to Isaiah 6. Yeah. The coal in Isaiah On 6 his touches yeah. the lips. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin and I will put fine garments on you. So he's purifying this priest. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. The Lord Almighty says, if you will walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge over my courts, and I will give you a place among these standing here. So this is part of this, I think, um, Potentially messianic kind of like because he's not gonna he's not gonna live up to this and we don't exactly know how um, at least I don't right here and maybe if there's other history of who like what happens with Joshua but just ultimately we know human being he's not gonna get get the job done yeah he's gonna come up short in some of this but there's this potential for him to be mm-hmm. something really significant here listen high priest Joshua you and your associates seated before you who are men symbolic of things to come. I'm going to bring, I wanted to get into this and I didn't, my servant, the branch, which is so awesome. It's very cool. So the branch is is uh, an allusion to the Messiah, mm-hmm. right? Um, the the root of David, mm-hmm. you, you get this, uh, the stump of Jesse. Yeah. Um, why why the stump? So I'll let you unpack this. So do, why do, do you know why? Do you know what the stump of Jesse and all that like referring to? Are we to? talking about... Are we going to talk about Nazareth or? Yeah, well, okay. but I, so that what I'm comes later. Of, so, what are you thinking? Yeah, so so David's line is cut off. Oh, right. Okay. So it seems like this yeah. isn't going to happen. Yeah. But then emerging out of this stump and just, David's house is kind of broken down as this branch that's actually going to become incredible. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So so let's go ahead and talk about Nazareth. So when I was in Israel, yeah, and um, uh, we went to Nazareth. And so we get this, uh, I forget, they handed us, you know, some materials in the bus on our way there. And the Nazareth literally means stick town, branch town. Mm-hmm. And this is where Jesus of Nazareth, yeah. this is where he comes yeah. from. So he is the branch. Um, yeah, so whenever we, whenever we sing, is he worthy, 
there's a line in that song, he is David's root mm. and the lamb who died to mm. ransom the slave. Yeah, I mean, that's the idea. Um, so, so cool. Uh, see the stone that I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that stone. So this is the idea I think of the... Of, I'm wondering if this is the cornerstone that we're going to read about later here in mm-hmm. chapter four. The seven eyes just is sort of referring to the idea that God sees all, uh, I think is what's happening here. And I will engrave an inscription on it, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of the sin of this land. I love this in a single day. I mean, you can just feel it. Amazing. Right? It is it's amazing. So it's great. so good. Yeah. Uh, and I love this. In that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under your vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. So that's so you can start to see my servant, this branch, mm-hmm. uh, allusions to Jesus. Okay, then let's look at chapter four, and we can start to kind of break this down. Then the angel who talked with me returned and woke me up like someone awakened from sleep. So he's not sleeping. He's describing this like being awakened from sleep. Uh, he asked me, what do you see? That's real revelation language, if, if you or revelation is using Zechariah language. What do you see? What are you looking at? And Zechariah answers, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it with seven channels to the lamps. So kind of hard to envision this. It's not easy quite to think about exactly how this works. It's a diff- um, We don't have a ton of record around. I did a little bit of study and research on this lamp. It's not supposed to be a menorah, um, but, but it would be a very... So you're talking about, I want to say, like 49 wicks, if you will, hmm. that are burning this oil. So it'd be a hmm. very vivid, wow. bright lamp. Because seven... So, so uh, a solid gold lampstand with a bowl at the top and seven lamps on it, seven channels to the lamps. Also, there are two olive trees by it. So there's a lamp flanked by two olive trees, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I asked the angel, what are these, Mm. my Lord? And he answered, do you not know what these are? No, my Lord. So he said to me, and he doesn't answer that. It's interesting that that the angel doesn't give direct answers in a Mm -hmm. few of these places. And we only read to verse six. We'll keep going here. But he says, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. So we've had, so we've had Joshua already has had mm-hmm. a word of the Lord to Joshua. Now he's speaking to Zerubbabel, mm-hmm. not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Famous verse. And then verse 7, and I really love verse 7. What are you, mighty mountain? Mm-hmm. Before Zerubbabel, you will become level ground. Then he will bring out the capstone or the foundation stone to shouts of uh, to shouts of God bless it, God bless it. So this is the sort of beginning in earnest of the work of the, the building mm. of the temple. Uh, then the word of the Lord came to me, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands will also complete it. So what has begun will be finished is the idea. Then you will know. Mm-hmm. Then you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Who dares, and I love this, who dares uh, to uh, despise the day of small things since the seven eyes of the Lord that range. So remember this stone with seven eyes? I'm thinking this idea of the the, the capstone, the foundation Mm -hmm. stone. So it's this idea that God is rejoicing that the work has begun. But we rejoice when it's over with. We, we 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 don't think it's completed until it's completed. But God sees when it starts, it will be completed. Hmm. That's the, the idea of small beginnings. The first step is often the mm-hmm. hardest and most important. Mm-hmm. And so when you're, you know, it's a good lesson here. When you're when you're taking a journey with the Lord, it's like, man, rejoicing at that first step. I think you yeah. could say rejoicing at every step. Yeah. That God is doing something, that mm-hmm. what he who has begun a work in you or in your kids will be faithful mm-hmm. to complete it. Mm-hmm. Um so it's a good it's a good reminder. Uh yeah, so they will rejoice when they see the chosen capstone in the hand of Zerubbabel. So it's this excitement that the work has begun because the Lord knows it will be completed. Then I asked the angel, what are these two olive trees on the right and on the left of the lampstand? And again, I asked him, so he's not answering easily here. What are these two olive branches beside the two gold pipes that pour out the golden oil? He replied, do you not know what these are? No, I said. So he said, these are the two who are anointed to serve the Lord of all the earth. Hmm. Okay. 
So kind of trying to unpack this. So to put it really simply, the olive trees are representative of Joshua and Zerubbabel. And it's, it's, t- it's tied together with this idea of anointing or oil. And so there's, this, is why, this is why this sermon was hard to preach because there's so many different... Uh, the symbolism is rich throughout, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you can tie it into lots of different mm-hmm. thoughts, and you have ideas anointed. So the word Messiah or the title Messiah means anointed one. So the idea is that, so the word anointing or to anoint me is the idea of covering someone with a liquid. Mm -hmm. And in the Old Testament case, this would be oil. And you can see that with, I think, David gets anointed with oil. Priests, Aaron gets anointed with oil. If you, yeah. There's that psalm about the oil running, running down. over Aaron's beard. Yeah. Yes, that. Mm-hmm. So it's this idea of a covering yeah. that comes on you that indicates power. And I would say position, like David is now king. Mm-hmm. Aaron is now high priest. So these are like roles um, this role or positional authority, if you will, mm-hmm. that someone now has. Well, I mean, Messiah is certainly that. So Jesus is Messiah, but he also fulfills the role of Messiah, if you will. Does that make sense? Yeah. So he's he's taking on this role. Isn't in some ways? I mean, you could say he's the Messiah before he's the before he receives the. This before he, yeah. before the spirit and before uh, uh, before the, the 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 anointing of him, if you will, and that's yeah. interestingly that none of the gospels, save maybe John, does John capture the the baptism of Jesus? Mm-hmm. Does he? I think so. I don't. It doesn't matter. Yeah. But at any rate, it's a very important event mm-hmm. in the three the three synoptics, mm-hmm. and the idea is that the dove comes down, and then the ministry begins. And it's in Luke, it's right after that, that Luke 4 happens. The spirit of the Lord is upon me, yeah. for he has, there's this word, anointed me. He's quoting Isaiah. He has anointed me to proclaim you know, good news to the poor, whatever it is. Uh, uh, Recovery mer- of sight to the blind, release of the captives. There yeah, you go. That's probably mixed up, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, something mm-hmm. like that. And But it's this, the role of the Messiah. Mm-hmm. And so right after this, Jesus says, today this has been fulfilled in your hearing. So anointed is this idea of oil uh, covering someone that is a representation. This is why there's so many, a representation of the spirits, the spirit empowering you. So not everyone that the spirit empowered was anointed with oil, but the oil is not magical. Right. It's it's just symbolic Mm -hmm. of what of what the spirit is going to do. Mm-hmm. So this idea here that we that we first have to sort of talk about is that the spirit is empowering, in this case, two men for this task that God is going to give. And ultimately, you could almost say three men here, Zechariah being the third, yeah. are each mm-hmm. empowered by the spirit for a particular role. Mm-hmm. The prophetic role, the priestly role, the wiping out of sin, and the kingly role, which is the... Rule and reign. The rule and reign. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. All of these, by the way, are ministry facets of Jesus. He mm-hmm. is all three, the prophet, the priest, and the king. Hebrews talks a bit about that. And so anyway, uh, yeah, but these guys are, are representative of this. And in this case, you have these two olive trees you have who are going to... Who are providing oil. So the idea is that they're tapped, the golden pipes are tapping these olive trees. And so out of these olive trees is flowing this oil. So the idea is that the spirit is on Zerubbabel and Joshua, Joshua, producing this ministry power that is then flowing into this lamp, which is the people, Mm -hmm. the witness of the community, you could say, the temple itself. And that shows up later in Zechariah 8. But it's the, they are the lamp. So this is it, like in, oh, um, and there's plenty of Old Testament allusion to this as well, but let's take uh, Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. Mm, mm-hmm. A city set on a hill cannot mm-hmm. be hidden. It's interesting, Jesus doesn't in that place say, I am the light of the world, right. which would be more comfortable. It would be <laughs> so much more comfortable. But, but it is, yeah. you are the light of the world. Mm-hmm. 
So the yeah, so it's it is this idea that the work of God in a people, in and through a people, becomes this light. The Jews were meant to be a light to the nations. All of this, uh, what you know, God's going to do through Abraham and Isaac. It, it is uh, uh, you're going to uh, through you, uh, the whole world will be blessed. Uh, is the idea. So so we'll we'll get there, but just kind of interpreting these symbols, you have the two olive trees representative of these two leaders who are empowered by the spirit, hence the oil, to then lead the people that creates witness uh, where people can see Mm. God is here. Mm. God is doing something. Yeah. That's, that's the idea. In fact, if we want to just go to Zechariah eight real quick and see, it would be verses 20 through 23. The three, and we can unpack this a little further. Uh, This is what the Lord Almighty says. So he's talking about the building of the temple here. If you read Mm -hmm. back through um, like verse nine, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Now hear these words, let your hands be strong so that the temple may be built. So that's the context. Now we've jumped down to verse 20. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Many peoples uh, and the inhabitants of many cities will yet come. So people coming from lots of places and the inhabitants of one city will go to another city and say, let us go at once and entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going. So people are coming from differing places, uh, many cities, it says, and many peoples of powerful nations will come to Jerusalem. So it almost sounds like the first group of people is sort of local, mm. maybe area. The second group of people are coming from further off, you know? Mm-hmm. And so many, many nations, the nations are always like, uh, biblically are always like not Jews. Mm-hmm. So now we're coming from other places to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat him. This is what the Lord Almighty says in those, in those days. Uh, Ten people from all languages and nations will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we have heard that God is with you. So there's this idea that this te- the temple will be, again, the witness of what God is doing here will be so bright that people will show up from lots of places and go, tell us what's going on. God's doing something here. Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of the picture that I wanted to lay out in in Zechariah, if we want to kind of yeah, that's, unpack what that means. That's so much us. fun. <laughs> yeah, I think that it's a, it is such a, like, Getting nerdy about the Bible is a lot of fun. It so, is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all the stuff that you can mine out. So I think one, I would say, it's one thing to come to church on a weekend and hear a sermon preached about the scriptures, but studying the yeah. scriptures yeah. is so valuable because yeah. of what the like the roots that can go down so deep in your heart about who God is and how he works with his people. Sure. Um, I mean, this is just my plug for yeah. study your Bibles. Yes. It's so much fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, let's talk about the spirit a little bit because that is the right. primary thing that you um, honed in on on this weekend, uh, specifically the not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says yeah. the Lord of hosts. And you talked about how the spirit works in us and then you talked about how the Spirit works through us. And it, 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 it is so simultaneous. So let's yeah. talk. So maybe define it this way. The, the, the Spirit of God is the empowering presence of God for the people mm-hmm. of God, for the work of God, if you will. So the Spirit's role seems to be, that we can discern through Scripture, to... to to empower, to, to bring about maybe the purpose of God in a, in a particular thing. So like at, like in creation, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God hovered over the face of the waters. And, it's, and then it's out of that Spirit hovering that life, light, yeah. begins to emerge. Yeah. So, you, so right away, you're getting this picture of the Spirit and then order emerging from chaos. Yep. And so and so you will see that through uh, throughout the scriptures, the spirit resting on people. I think Bezalel is actually the first mm-hmm. and one. And Aholiab. Huh? It's Bezalel and Aholiab. Really? The okay. Two guys. I don't know who's okay. So are yeah. they are they are they given they're, together? They're craftsmen. Okay. Yeah. But really, I didn't, I didn't catch I'm the, pretty there was a second sure. one. I, I knew there was one. That's cool. Okay. It doesn't matter. No, I so in look, Exodus, but... Bezalel mm-hmm. is, is a craftsman mm-hmm. who is said to be 
empowered by the Spirit of God Mm -hmm. for the crafting of the tabernacle. And so as God gives Moses instructions for building the tabernacle, Bezalel, and maybe this other I dude. Mean, you might be wrong. I don't now know. I, now right. I, I, I'm not, I'm not like super wrong. well-versed. I might be wrong. Yeah, I might, you might be wrong. Joseph I don't know. might be right. I don't, um, Quinn, will you be our fact checker? Quinn is is our producer and she's gonna she's gonna look it up for us how do you find how do you google a whole who a holy a holy am spell it <laughs> roughly oh 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 yeah oh uh, yeah or just look at bezalel yeah it and, says and, these two craftsmen are filled with god's spirit to design and craft the tabernacle well, okay, <laughs> <laughs> so there's two of them nailed it and, and is it bezalel and and Oholia. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All right, good job. Amazing. Great. But this, okay, but again, filled with God's spirit. Yeah. But what for? A task. And interestingly, and this is, how about this? He's the first one. I don't think anybody else has said to be filled with the no. spirit of God before this. No. But isn't it interesting that what is the task that they're filled with the spirit of God mm-hmm. for is the building of the temple. Yeah. So it's the same thing. I hadn't thought about that before, but it's the same thing as here. But the Spirit shows up with lots of other people, as we already said. David, mm-hmm. Samuel, mm-hmm. others are anointed. Mm-hmm. Aaron, I know, is anointed mm-hmm. um, yeah. as high priest. Yeah. And so this anointing piece, what are you thinking? I don't. It's just so cool to think about the Holy Spirit empowering people to create this, create, I don't know why I said that, create this space for God to dwell. So if you think about the Spirit hovering yeah. over the okay, waters sure. in Genesis 1, there is this space that in you could yeah. co- call it like a cosmic temple. Yeah, like God yeah, yeah, never yeah, intends to dwell apart from His people. Right. And so the Holy Spirit wow. is always about creating space wow. for God to dwell with His people. Yeah. And that's and that's what we're, yeah, we're called wow. to do. That's really, so, really cool. Yeah. So... So then, and then, and then, especially we, as we've already identified, we see this in Christ. Mm-hmm. So that He is again mm-hmm. this very important event of the baptism, mm-hmm. and He literally says to John, "Hey, do this so that we can fulfill all righteousness." And this is the dove comes down there, symbolic of the Spirit resting on Jesus for ministry, mm-hmm. and it's it's only after this baptism that then that then the miracles begin. So yeah. we have some kind of apocryphal accounts of Jesus doing miracles as a child, but there's there's no biblical record of this. Right. The miracles begin after after the 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 spirit baptism. Now, just a side note uh, because I, you know, we're Bible nerds. So there is and I have read and I forget who. But the, I think there is c- could Jesus do miracles just because He is the Son of God, or did he need the Spirit's empowerment? And most of the time, I think it is, he's the things he's doing are through the power of the Spirit. But there's a couple times where it seems, and I cannot remember that he he might like maybe John two is one of these examples, because I don't know if John two my my time has not yet come, but because of his divinity, that anyway. You don't like this idea. I, I mean, well, I, I <laughs> that he could act apart from the, the power of the spirit. He's oh, God. I, d- I mean, yeah, but well, <laughs> I, I, he, yes, I think that Philippians two is probably the yeah. where Empty I would himself? go as far sure. as yeah, him setting aside, like it's this idea of he's not just gonna pull out the God card whenever he wants to. No, but he doesn't. He's, so yeah. it's rare. And, uh, but, but I do, okay, okay. I do also like this, that there throughout the Gospel of John, there is this idea of cooperation. Like yeah. if you're asking things according to God's will, he's going to give you but, the things that you ask. And so I think there's, I think there's more. I mean, I think what we would say is that's the rule. Yeah. And yes. there are maybe some exceptions to that rule with yeah. Christ. I don't think there of are. Okay. <laughs> Fine. I don't know. You might be in disagreement with John Stott or D.A. Carson. I can't okay. remember who. But okay. there's, it was probably one of them that I read, but it, but it, interesting. Yeah. I, you know, who knows? Yeah. We can speculate. Yeah. Okay. So he's baptized with the Spirit, or the Spirit comes upon him, power now for mm-hmm. ministry. He. This is when everything really starts taking off. The miracles start happening and so forth. And his kind of, let's say, stepping out as a... Um, as as Messiah really begins, 
So the idea is that the Spirit empowers a person for for whatever the task is that God has for them. And that's that's really what I was wanting to highlight out of this, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. And so the idea is like, what has God called you or tasked you, commissioned you to do? And there's some, for for a lot of us, it's like very basic, like, uh, are you victory over sin? Mm. Yes. Mm-hmm. How does that happen? Mm-hmm. Not by might, yes. not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Uh, are you a mom? Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit. Are you a father? Works the same way. The mm-hmm. capacity to be, to the capacity to love others and have a have a not just be a loving person, but to to but through the, like to love people with a supernatural kind of self sacrificial kind of love. Like, what is God called? What is He asking you to do? To give, to okay. trust, all of these things so, are empowered so wh- by the Spirit. What you're saying to me, yes is that the same spirit that empowered Jesus to do ministry yes is the holy spirit yes. that we have yes yes it's almost okay. like i put that in my notes on the week on my slides yeah that's the idea okay. uh, that, and it's a profound thought i you it know really my my, is. my it's one that i don't think about enough to be perfectly honest with you i think probably a lot of god's people don't think about it very often that the same, if you think about it, the same spirit that hovered over the face of the deep at creation. It's remarkable to think about this it's is the spirit that blowing. lives in you. Yes. And so, and so what that means is that, so here's why, you know, where for me, I mean, it, it's such a good reminder to think when you're facing adversity. I, I mean, I could, you know, you're raising kids. And it feels like a mountain mm. that you're trying, an you know, mm. insurmountable task. Mm-hmm. That's what they all like. Uh, what does it say about uh, what are you, Almighty Mountain, yeah. before Zerubbabel? Yeah. I mean, how do, how often yeah. do we look at what we're facing? Yeah. That that you know, uh, uh, as a circumstance or whatever is happening, and it feels as as an insurmountable mountain. But again, the idea is that through the power of the Spirit. That 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 these things that God uh, works in you and through you to to overcome these circumstances and mm-hmm. accomplish what it is that He's called you to accomplish. Is there any correlation to Mark eleven twenty three and twenty four? Yes, Please. absolutely. It's the okay. same idea of whoever says that this mountain be thou removed and yeah. be cast in the sea. That's the idea. Yeah. It, it it it's the idea that that this that the uh, that the task for which. So what God has put, what God has called you to, in this case, rebuilding the temple, yeah. and it may as well have felt that there was a mountain of, of uh, obstacles, obstacles, yeah. obstruction in front mm-hmm. of them uh, to stop them from doing so. The, the encouragement. That's why. That's why they're being told this on the front end. Yeah. Because it's gonna. Because you're you're gonna be a million times where you're gonna doubt yourself. Yes. And I mean, I think we've all been there when you're trying to follow the Lord, and it's like I I can't do this, or I I'm. Whatever, uh, you know, when you when you've sinned again, and it feels as though, yeah. you know, I mean, there's there's a lot of things where it's like I know what this feels like, but to be reminded that you're not doing all of this in your own strength, but that the Spirit of the Living God mm-hmm. empowers you for this. It doesn't mean, you know, it doesn't mean that you, you know, have, um, you know, that you'll never. Uh, you know that when accessing this, you know you'll you'll never you'll never have problems, or you'll never screw up, right. or, or nothing will ever go wrong. But rather that that God's Spirit is working in you and with you to accomplish what it is that He wants to accomplish. And sometimes yeah. that that takes you on a rather roundabout path that doesn't seem like the most direct way to get there. In fact, almost almost never. You yeah. do you take the direct path? Yeah, or the path that you think is direct. That's right. I think I think it's interesting that over and over again in scripture it says that I will make your path straight. I will yeah. make the ground level underneath yeah. you. And yeah. you feel like, wait, if I'm depending on my might and my power, this is the way that I would go. Yeah. And it seems like A B. Yeah. And God is saying, like, if you're being led by my spirit, yeah. I see I it's I see above this situation. Well, I mean, I mean, the Exodus is a great example of this. The path from yeah. Egypt to Canaan is much more direct mm-hmm. than what the Lord led them on. Mm-hmm. But he had he had things to do in them. Yeah, 
there were things that needed to be accomplished. And so we're not going to go the direct way. We're going to go my way. Yeah. And it's going to work some things out on you. It's really, yeah. Interestingly, he initially said, I'm not going to send them this way because they're not ready for war yet, or they're not ready to encounter opposition yet. Yeah. And so I'm going to take them around. And then they had, I mean, and then longer and longer and longer. So what it means is, you know, if you remember Mary Poppins, when they're tasked with cleaning up the nursery and the Jane and Michael don't want to do it. Hmm. And so then Mary Poppins comes in and she starts singing and all the hmm. toys and things start putting themselves away. It's not that. No, no, it's not <laughs> So this that. is not the work of the Spirit. Yeah. Is not that I'm just going to stand passively yeah. by and watch this be accomplished. This is where Haggai's message comes in. Be strong and work. Yeah. So they're working. Yeah. But And so I think the reason you have to be reminded of this is that it's going to feel like nothing supernatural is happening mm. many to- at many mm. points, but it's the continued consistent uh, you know, diligence of staying with it that then the Lord is working in you and blessing what you're doing, and, mm-hmm. and you accomplish more than you would have and could have on your own. So mm-hmm. that's the first idea. Yeah. And then the second idea that we wanted to talk about was what? What did I say? I don't know. It's, what it's, did it's, you what's say? What's this here? You said, oh... No, living in the... No, that's not questions. My order <laughs> no, my second Your slides are right was, there. It had to do with... So oh, you, through you, through you, through you. Yeah, the idea of going like the spirit working So he's doing you. things in you, and yeah. then he's doing things through you. Okay, and, so the lamp. So yeah. the, tree is the, the trees would represent the empowering presence of God on a person. But then the lamp is the result of this, the light, the witness. So there's so much. So let's just look at Acts 2 really okay. quickly. And... You can totally see this playing out in Acts 2, and you can even see so many allusions to and similarities to what's happening and what has happened, what we've already read in Zechariah. So Acts, actually Acts 1, we'll start there. The promise that Jesus makes about the Holy Spirit, who we've been talking about. So do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. I mean, it can't be much more clear than that. Mm-hmm. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, are you at this time going to restore mm-hmm. the kingdom of Israel? They were looking for a political... Uh, th- their understanding, the whole Jewish understanding right. of the Messiah was a political kingdom, the, and, and it's not happening. And so he says, it's not for you to know the times or the dates the Father is set by his own authority. He doesn't deny that this will happen, um, and there is so that the, the the kingdom of God, the the full and complete kingdom of God, but it's not going to happen. At the, uh, it's coming at the second coming, not the first coming, right? So here's the. So he says, um, "You will receive power when the Holy Spirit." Here's what I mean again: that the Holy Spirit is the empowering presence of God for the people of God to do the work of God. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. So you can see there's both this idea of power and witness, power and witness, power and witness, power and witness. And I, you know, one one phrase I said on Saturday night that I changed the language for, but it's also that the anointing meant two things: uh consecration mm. and and power. Hmm. So, like, they anointed mm-hmm. all the the furniture of the temple or tabernacle, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and the, the the anointing is meant to say, like, it's marking, like, that belongs to... Mm-hmm. So I think this is part of the Holy Spirit, like, sealing, the Holy Spirit seals you. Yeah. It's like, you belong to, to God. Yeah. Um, which is great news, but also, I think this kind of consecration idea is this this idea that you're set apart for a holy use and purpose. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so that's what's going to happen here. You're going to be my witnesses. I think that's a, maybe the idea of consecration in some way. You've been set apart for a specific job. Mm. Now, what, I'm, what I was talking about the weekend that I talked about this is that the word witness uh, is, is synonymous with the word martyr, especially early on, like early in Christian history. It had come to be basically an interchangeable word. And... And so, you know, even in even in uh, the new Mad Max movies, they they do the the war boys who are worship Immortan Joe when they martyr themselves, they say yeah, witness. Me. I think that um, the word the Greek word for witness. Yes, it, it, it is, is might be Latin. Oh, is it Latin? I think okay. it might be. Someone sent it to um, me actually, uh, like that weekend, and said, I, I, "This just popped up today." Yeah. It's the same thing. Yeah. So this idea of witness is to you know what I was talking about is like. 
this capacity to live a life poured out before God as a as a living sacrifice. Mm-hmm. That because most of us, dare I say, maybe none of us listening to this, um, will will ever be at a point in our lives where we'll be asked to choose between denying Christ or death. And and I thank God that that's the case. However, it doesn't mean that my life is not not a witness. It, it just it just means that my witness is in a different way. So so often when we think about witnessing, we think about you know sharing our faith with someone. Sure, but I think much more than that, it's the idea of living your life in such a sacrificial way that you you know what is this that they may see your good deeds and gl- mm-hmm. glorify your Father. And so so let your Light. Light shine, and isn't it interesting yeah. that the symbol of of the so the two trees are empowering a light? Yeah. So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father which is in heaven. This is this is what I think is going on in 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 uh, in Zechariah eight. All these nations showing yeah. up and saying, "What's going on here?" Mm-hmm. At the work of this, the completion of this temple, this is what's going to happen. Well, this is what did happen in Acts two. So you're familiar with this, most of us would be. When the day of Pentecost came, this is mm-hmm. 50 days after the crucifixion, mm-hmm. they were all together in one place, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. So by the way, just to not get too much of this, but there's my dad's my dad's talked about this before, but the and I think he's I don't know, I think he's right. That that here so the upper room is mentioned at the end of they're in an upper room. In the end of one, but we don't know they're in an upper room in two. Hmm. It just says when the day of Pentecost came, mm-hmm. they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house. There are some who think that house is in reference to the temple, the house of God. Oh. That this is that this is literally happening in the te- hmm. inside the temple in the house. Where they were sitting, and they seemed they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each one of them. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. There's that empowering thing, but also we're going to see this witnessing thing. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. I mean, this I, I, I I've never heard anyone tie Zechariah eight to this, but it feels like a, a yeah. fulfillment of Zechariah eight. All these nations yeah. are here. And when they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because they each heard their own language being spoken. I'm not going to read all the different languages. There are a lot, but they look at at each other and say, what does this mean? And so then Peter addresses them and begins to declare uh, – he begins to declare the gospel to them. He mm-hmm. begins to share Jesus with them. And then eventually at the end end of all of this, he says, basically after he talks about Jesus, yeah. he says, "We uh, here it is. Uh, 37? Yeah. They were cut 32. to the heart? God oh, okay. has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses mm. of it. Exalted, you know, uh, uh, exalted to the right hand of God. He has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and poured out uh, uh, what you now see and hear. Yeah, I love That's it. so cool. So, yeah. so the idea, my point was this. The Spirit empowers you for what God has called you to do. Victory over sin, sanctification, becoming more like Christ. These are all things that the Spirit has empowered you to do. Every believer, you could say this. All of those are things He's empowered you to do. But it's not just for you that that oil of the Spirit, if you will, that is empowering you for this life in Christ is also meant to, to, to feed a flame that is meant to burn in you mm that becomes a light that people can see. Hmm. And I think this happens in the self-sacrificial way that we live and love and treat one another. This is why I said this week, that weekend, I think the community of believers, the gathered body of Christ is the greatest apologetic we have for, yeah. uh, for the Lord. Because, and also the, our, 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 it's our greatest witness and also our, 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 our greatest detriment when we don't do this well. Man. Because I think people are meant to see the self-sacrificial way in which we love one another. Mm-hmm. Jesus said by this, all men will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another, that we love and sacrifice for one another. And I, I saw this at a, I, I shared this story, but I was at Kenneth and Terry Reed's 20th wedding anniversary celebration. And uh, their builder got up, built this beautiful home that they have. And 
she got up and, and just started talking about what she experienced and working with them. And I was struck by how she described mm-hmm. Kenneth um, submitting his preferences to Terry yeah. and Terry submitting her preferences. And I mean, I, I it spoke to me because I've been in many, I'm pretty opinionated from a design perspective and Heather and I, yeah, it doesn't go well when it comes time to collaborate, but like on stuff like that. And I thought about it. I was like, wow, the way that in their marriage, even, you know, picking out a countertop or selecting a paint color, if you've ever built a house, you know, how all this goes that even in that, that, that we would, that we would so serve one another that for this woman, it marked her and she was commenting on, she literally said, I don't have this kind of relationship, you know, in her own relationships, it hasn't been this mm-hmm. way. But she had seen what the way they loved one another and was so moved by it that she wanted to get up and say something mm-hmm. at their, not just being nice. She was like, I don't normally come to anything like this, but I want to, you know, she came. I, I, and that, that stood out to me. I thought, I think this is witness. I think that's what witness is. Yeah. People see, empowered by the spirit to, to lay your life down. This is not just somebody who's, you know, a couple that's found their perfect match. Mm-hmm. But really marriage, as we're going to dig into in this next series, is is the willful choice to oh my serve another. Yeah. And I think that can become a powerful testimony to your kids, to your community, to other people. But yeah. I think married or not, I think the point remains is that that's what the Spirit empowers us to do. So if we're talking to, as we're kind of, um, like as we're talking about what it means to... Um, be empowered for witness. If you're talking to somebody who's listening to this podcast um, and they're asking the question, well, how does that work practically for me? Can you share a little bit about what that would look like? Well, for me, it's less about, Lord, you know, I want to be a witness maybe, but more, more like letting the Lord do in me. I think it happens sort of I don't know, maybe supernaturally yeah. right that it's not yeah. that it's not through a, a strong effort of mine to drum all of this up but mm-hmm. to allow the lord first to have his way in you mhm mm-hmm. and i don't have to i don't have to work hard to have i mean i do and i'm not saying this like in any sort of braggadocious way that people will come up to me and say you've changed or you're different or whatever people would have known me or whatever have watched growth of me or so forth. And this is not for me, you know, I'm not trying to celebrate myself here, but that's not anything that I ever set out to do. Yeah. It, you know, when I was like in my, what I would call my real Jesus journey, I wasn't, I wasn't even thinking about, it was just the furthest thing from my mind that I would be, that my life would be some kind of witness to other mm-hmm. people that would, that would be, I don't know, inspiring to them or draw them to Jesus I had no clue. That yeah. didn't occur to me, and neither yeah. did I l- look for it or want it, mm-hmm. but it just happens. I, I don't know who it is. Charles Wesley, John Wesley, I'm not sure who. I'm, I get the Wesley brothers mixed up, but I think it's one of them that said something to the effect, if you want to see, like, like set, set a man on fire, and yeah, and other people will come just to watch him burn. Yeah, yeah. I think it's that. yeah. I think that's the idea. That, it's that, interesting yeah. the idea of flame. Yeah, here. Ruth Haley Barton talks about allowing, like, letting people see your transforming life. Yeah. Like, and I absolutely agree with that. And I think uh, John Coe, he's one of my professors, yeah. he talks about how God is not looking for someone who is will less, like, just like, uh, like, um, they have no will or or somebody who is willful, like, I'm going to do this in my own power. What God is looking for is somebody who is willing, mm-hmm. like he is looking for yielded people. Yeah. And um, yeah, there's no limit to what God can do with a yeah, surrendered life. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. And so, I, you know, that's that's a great way to say it is there's yeah. no limit to what God can do with it through a surrendered life. And I think that is what the, I think the role of the Spirit is is surrendering yeah. to, to, to the work of the Spirit in you. And then let the Lord do what He wants. Yeah. Do what you want. I, this is not my life anymore. And that's yeah. what Paul, that's that's Paul's posture. Uh, so I think when you do that, you you set yourself up to be a living witness. Yeah. And it's absolutely beautiful. Yes. Yeah.